Hello, and welcome to another episode of Lightning Studio Podcast. I'm here today with our president, Dr. Colleen Perry Keith. So you've been here for over... About nine months. Nine months now. Yeah, long enough to give birth. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Yeah. Um, could you tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, like how and why you chose GBC? Sure. Um, this is one of those opportunities for me where the personal and the professional really intertwined well. I was looking for an opportunity, if it arose, to get closer to my son. He's in Washington, D.C., and an opportunity to get closer to my mom and dad, who are in northern New York. They live north of Syracuse. Where I was in North Carolina was about eight and a half hours to my son, and then about 15 to my parents. And Goldie Beacom was a lot closer. <laughs> I'm less than two to my son, and then less than five to my mom and dad. So that was important to me. It, I've just gotten to that point in life where I need to be helping out in that way. And, and I'm hoping that to be a grandmother at some point. So that would be kind of fun to be near my grandchildren. So um, that personal side of it was there. And then the professional side of it was there. Goldie Beacom is one of those schools that has financial stability and strong focus on their majors and a consistent presence. And that was important to me because so much of not-for-profit higher education is really in flux. <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of um, financial issues, a lot of issues with public confidence in the liberal arts and that sort of thing. And so this offered an opportunity for professional development and professional challenge that I felt like I could come and bring the creativity that I bring to my leadership and really um, have it have a very fulfilling career here. And so it really was the personal and the professional that came together. And that rarely happens in life. So once I saw it happening, I thought, you know, how could I not do this? Yeah. Well, we are so lucky that you're here. <laughs> really. Um, so at the uh, International Women's Day, that, that mm -hmm. event, you gave a speech about uh, the importance of higher education, mm -hmm. um, specifically for women there. But could you yeah. talk about your kind of love for education and sure. how you've been around it? Yeah, I, I grew up in Parish, New York, which is right now about a town of maybe 500, um, economically quite depressed, and never, you know, very rural and never really had any industry in the area. Most of the people there would drive into Syracuse to work, and they worked at the various plants there. And over time, a lot of those car plants and that sort of thing have, have gone out. So it's economically pretty depressed. And I had about a hundred, I think I had 108 students in my graduating class. And of that, fewer than 10 of us went on to college right out of high school. Now, many did go later, but, um, but right out of high school, very few did. And I have a lot of friends back there that are still there that I grew up with. And they're, they struggle financially, and had they gone on and gotten an education, education truly is the way out. It gave me the base of knowledge that I need and the transferable skills that I need, where I think if I wasn't working in higher education, I could still be successful in another industry, <clears throat> probably in another not-for-profit human services industry, just giving my, given my interests. But education was my ticket to a future. And I saw it happen time and again, and I see it happen in my students now for those that, you know, come and really take it seriously and figure out what their future could be. It's a way for them, you know, to be able to make a good life for themselves going forward. And I think the studies bear that out. There was um, a study recently by Georgetown <clears throat> that talks about the uh, return on investment. And the return on investment for Goldie Beacom over time is really high. So students that graduate with a degree from here are making slightly under a million more over the course of their career than students that are attending elsewhere. I feel like I'm a prime example of that as well. I mean, I wasn't a great student, but mm -hmm. education opened all of the doors that I thought you know mm -hmm. could be open in different ways, like you said, 
number the biggest one was the transferable skills yeah. the relationships that you make at, at a college and mm-hmm. kind of the freedom to pursue like you said to find yourself and find your career and the things that you love and yeah you really seem to have your finger on the pulse when it comes to like the evolution of education where it's changing in different ways and and um you know where students can find that value and find themselves from your experience this is your third uh, institution that you've been the president what have Mm -hmm. you felt like are the biggest changes or things that you've had to adapt to um first we've had to in higher ed in general has had to adapt to a changing society and students traditional age students are not coming to colleges as well prepared as perhaps they were and that's really because the k-12 through system in this country has had to take on the solution for everything. They feed students breakfast, they feed students lunch, a lot feed students dinner. They provide before and after school care. Um, There's just a lot of stressors out there for the American family and the schools are the places that have to respond to that and, and try to help in any way they can. And unfortunately, that gets in the way of teaching. And so students are being cared for and taught and I think the K through 12 system is doing a pretty remarkable job considering everything that's on their plate. And then, um, so, but that has impacted colleges because we're finding students are coming to us less well prepared than they were, you know, 20 and 30 years ago. So the need to offer remedial level courses to help students catch up is, is a big change. And so we've had to really look at that and adapt to it. Um, the advent of technology, <laughs> the internet and online learning and all of that has truly revolutionized everything. And uh, Goldie Beacom has been a little bit behind the times with all of that. Now with this coronavirus, you know, we actually were one of the first to respond. We started our response on uh, March 9th and 10th. And by March 11th, we had made the decision to move online And we immediately started training our faculty how to use the various technology. We're very fortunate that we've had some staff who had us ready well in advance of that. But technology has changed everything in higher education and how students learn. You know, when uh, my favorite times are uh, when I go to a faculty meeting here or elsewhere, and faculty are talking about how students don't read books anymore because everything is electronic or electronic databases. And that's all true. And so we have to be able to respond as a school. So you kind of watch those trends over time. And then um, you watch, too, the the cost analysis of what college costs. And that has been a big change over time. The cost has gone up for, you know, what... um, what it costs to educate a student. And that's because people cost money and people are program in higher education. So you can't really reduce costs and you have to pay your people. And that becomes a real race to try to figure out how do you maintain your quality? How do you pay your people? And to pay your people, you have to have bigger enrollments and all of that sort of thing. So the challenges from the financial end have become much more, uh, much more in a daily activity for me to have to worry about. And the balance I have to find is how do you, how do you balance that against making student-centered decisions? You know, if you cut something, what does that mean for the student? If you add something, what does that mean for the student? And because at the end of the day, it's all about the student and it's about providing that education. And that's become more of a challenge I have found over time. So those are really the kind of the big picture things that impact us. Yeah, you really touched on a lot of what I was kind of <laughs> try to flow that into, the student okay. first decisions. <laughs> Everything kind of comes back to that. And, you know, it's interesting how you laid out a lot of the, the challenges that, that you mentioned that how complex it can be and, and how really it does come back to the student. Mm-hmm. Um, you got your doctorate degree mm-hmm. in uh, student affairs, correct? Mm-hmm. Higher ed administration and student affairs from the Ohio State University. And, uh, <laughs> the <awesome>. Ohio State. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And that really sounds like like a student first degree. Yeah, it is. You know, the college presidency is an interesting animal. Um, it used to be that college presidents came up from the faculty. 
And so you had a faculty member who became a department chair, who became a, a division chair, who became a vice president for academic affairs or provost, and then went into the presidency. And, and they're all fine people, but they are not trained in management principles. And <clears throat> so many, many years ago, let's see, I probably in the around sometime in the 80s, I would say the 1980s, the field of higher administration became a field in its own right. And, uh, you know, a whole program of academic study. And the reason why was because of the acknowledgement that higher ed is a business. And it is not a business like General Motors or DuPont or any place like that. But it is a business, and it is the business of higher ed, and you needed people who were trained in the business of higher ed to know how to run it. And there, I remember early on, because I've been in this business a long time, um, you know, there was a lot of scoffing at, oh, well, you have a degree in higher education administration. Yeah, that's like not really a field. And I think over time, the acknowledgement has come that not only is it a field, but it's a very necessary field. And you know, you want people who have the competence in management principles to understand how to run this particular industry that we're in. And it doesn't take anything away from the classroom because that comes down to having respect and uh, valuing the role of the faculty in the enterprise. And so the fact that I didn't come up from the faculty it really hasn't been an issue for me because I respect and they have their role. Higher ed is also managed by a shared governance principle. And there are three partners in governance. There's the board of trustees, there's the administration, and then there's the faculty. And all three partners in governance have voice. They all have a role to play in the, in the administration of the institution. And they all have vote. Now, the only vote that really counts is the board vote because the board is the leadership of the institution. Mm -hmm. But all three have voice and vote, and all three have to work together. And the role of administration and the role of that degree in higher ed administration is to be able to manage that process. And so you'll find some colleges that have people who have my kind of training, um, you know, operate one way and people who come into the presidency without that kind of background sometimes operate a little bit differently. In the end, we all figure it out and we all manage and we all talk together, so that helps. But um, that degree program became, has, it's probably one of the newer academic fields, but it's got its own body of research and all of that now. And I think you'll find going forward a lot of people really pursuing that kind of degree in order to manage higher ed. And you stay abreast of the changes in higher ed, too, because that's always being fed into those degree programs. That's interesting um, to hear that, especially, you know, because, like you said, now, it, you know, it's even more complex with, with how you have to, you know, you're coming into a new institution and mm -hmm. we're going through a strategic plan. And, you know, you, ha you do have a lot of these different people with different experiences and different styles. Mm -hmm. How do you personally go about kind of, you know, trying to to reinforce the idea that it's student first decisions? And, and, uh, and it, it seems obvious, but that students right. are most important. I think I have to model it and say it a lot. Um, Goldie Beacom has been very fortunate that they've built some financial stability. Not every school has that. And Goldie Beacom operated like a business for a long time, but not always like the business of higher education. And that's where the difference comes in. And so I have to come in and talk about what it means to make a student first decision and put the student at the center of that. Now, fortunately here, we're small. And our faculty is incredibly student-focused. <laughs> they, they worry about individual students, and they know their names, and, and that makes a big difference, and it makes life a lot easier for me. Um, and then it's just some of our practices and policies that we've had to really tweak so that we're making sure that when the student needs something, we're able to respond to that. So it comes down to office hours and um, organizational structure and you know how we're 
how we're having employees approach their work, that sort of thing. So I think I just have to keep it at the, at the forefront of my thinking all the time, but I also have to say it all the time so that people hear, you know, here's a student first decision. I had a, uh, just uh, before I came in here, had a uh, situation with, I had an email <clears throat> and a student who doesn't have access to technology through you know this whole coronavirus situation and so you know what's the response to that and I said now you know we have to if we're putting the student at the center of this decision here are three options so I listed what the three options were and sent that back to the person asking the question but you know we we have to adjust and we have to be consistent in our responses too, but we have to be consistent understanding that there are individual realities within that too. Yeah, no, and you really do model that. And, uh, and it's, I've definitely felt it from student affairs. I'm sure uh, my whole department specifically, <laughs> and, a, and a lot of people at the college too. Um, I'm just going to completely screw up this saying, but uh, <laughs> there's a quote that, you know, some people have, some people choose to be leaders and some people have leadership thrust upon them. Mm -hmm. Your leadership has just been great. What are some of the experiences or mentors or phases of your life? And when did you know that you wanted to be in leadership? I don't think I ever thought about wanting to be in leadership. I was working um, at Ohio State's uh, regional campus in Marion, Ohio, and there was a job opening probably about 20 miles down the road at Methodist Theological School in Ohio. And uh, my husband at the time said, you really ought to, you ought to apply for that. That's a, that would be you. That sounds like you. <clears throat> and so um, I thought about it for a while and, and I applied. And then I had a trustee from the, from Methodist Theological School who was also involved with Ohio State. He was a vice president at Ohio State. And he, I knew him from the Marion campus of Ohio State and didn't know about his involvement at the theological school. And he said, you know, you need to really be thinking about this and talk to me about it. So he, he played that role as mentor. He has passed on now. His name is John Mount. But he was a real mentor. Then when I got to Methodist Theological School, I worked for a gentleman named Ned DeWire. And he was one of those people who just gave me experiences. He first figured out, you know, worked with me for a while. I, I went as the assistant to the president there. So I ran the activities of the president's office and I worked with the board of trustees. And <clears throat> he really worked with me and would give me more things as time went on. Eventually I went from assistant to the president to vice president for development. The reason I did that was because uh, we had a vice president for development who left and we were in the middle of a capital campaign. And it was a $15 million campaign and we were at, sitting at about seven and a half million. And the president said, look, I think we can just do this ourselves. I don't really wanna replace that position right now. So you and I just need to get this done. So <laughs> I stepped into that role and we finished that campaign at 18 million so we, um, that 15 million was the goal, so we oversubscribed at 18 million. And then um, I did that for a while, and then we were entering into another campaign. And because you're always raising money, that's an important piece of what the president does. And so the president said, Look, I want to do a major campaign before I retire, so I need to be out. So I'm going to make you executive vice president. So he did, and my role was over everything outside the classroom, and then our academic dean was over everything inside the classroom. So that experience at a small place, I had to do a little bit of everything, and I really learned the nuts and bolts of how to, how to manage a college through that really experience. I was taking everything I was learning in the classroom as a, as a doctoral student and then putting it into play in daily living at the at the theological school and so <clears throat> from that point having worked in that kind of setting I really had no desire to be a college president because it's a 24-7 job and I saw what he did and to me you know I just had other things I wanted to do I wanted to go to my son's basketball games and not have to worry about what else was awaiting for me and um, 
Eventually, I went to work at Ohio University in their foundation, which was a pure fundraising um, job. And while I was there, that same president from the theological school called and he said, hey, I'm working with a search firm and there's this college in South Carolina and you have to, you have to look at this. So he brought over all the materials from that search and they sat on the counter and it was my husband who actually said, you know, you need to look at this. This is definitely you. So I never would have gone. I, I wouldn't have pursued it at all, but I was really pushed and, you know, listened to my husband who said, this sounds like you, this is something that I think you could do. And he was born and raised in Ohio and hadn't lived outside of the state of Ohio. So he was ready for some adventure. So we talked about it. I applied and went, but it's that, I think the best preparation I had was that experience at the seminary, being able to put the theory I was learning in the classroom into action in a job that needed it every single day. So that, but leadership was really never anything that I wanted to do. I just know that things need to run well and it bothers me when they don't run well. And I'm not, um, I don't like inefficiency and I don't like when institutions are all about themselves and not about their mission. And so when I see that sort of thing, it really um, engages me to want to do, <laughs> to want to make it right. And so that's kind of how I've ended up doing what I do. I think I could probably do the same thing in other roles too, but higher ed is something that I think helps people and it's um, it's a place that I have felt at home. Yeah, no, that's an incredible, uh, you know, like background and experience and you to get to that position. And uh, it kind of seems that it's all comes together for, you know, situations like we're currently in, like the coronavirus yeah. pandemic. It's currently um, the 23rd and uh, yeah. this will probably come out on the following Monday or so. But, um, you know, and so bringing all that experience together with with, um, you know, management and student first decisions and working together with all these different areas. Um, and then, and then having, bringing our institution like almost completely online. It is now, mm -hmm. um, yeah. what has been some of the biggest challenges in this certain situation and just leadership and adversity in general? Yeah. Um, first having been a college president for 10 years in the South, in the Carolinas, I was six years in South Carolina, four years in North Carolina, where you have hurricanes in it's the same, you know, this is more serious. And with a hurricane, you, you can pretty much pinpoint when it's going to hit. <laughs> so there's some more certainty there, but I had to, I had to make decisions and you, you know, people's lives are at stake in that kind of situation. So, um, I think the experience I had there doing that, um, really helped a whole lot for this, uh, COVID-19 situation that we have. But, um, you know, the, what we had to do first in this situation was control for the impact on the student. And we knew that we hadn't done anything online ever, but I also know that I have a heck of a lot of smart faculty members and they can figure it out. So we met with our faculty leadership and said, look, this is coming. I think we got to move it all online. And for a school that for 134 years had done nothing online, <laughs> that was a pretty big decision. So, you know, we made that move, but did it so that we felt like we could support the students. And we had um, folks in our, uh, within the staff, Monica Rashevi and her husband Peter and Rusty Mahalik, they had done a lot of work to get us into the right technological platforms and they were ready to go probably about a year ago and we're helping our faculty to learn how do you teach using technology so when we made the decision we just knew our faculty would be well supported and it's not without some bumps in the road we have a few bumps in the road but we're smoothing those out and then you know we can just kind of move that ahead our students um I think when we made the decision to have students move home, uh, I think families were pretty happy with that because people want to have their, their kids around them. And I do too. <laughs> you know, I've been in contact with my son. But 
you know, we needed to do that and do it fairly quickly. And, you know, we'll manage, you know, through that, all those issues that arise. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking like the whole leadership in this time is, is a huge test of every, everything that you bring with you to the table when you sit in the chair that I sit in. Um, but if you keep your students at the center of your focus and you keep your faculty and the mission of the institution at the center of your focus, everything else falls in line. You can make those decisions a lot easier. Yeah, and yourself and the executive council and, and like you said, and a lot of those people who have who've done a lot for this situation, you guys have done great. And yeah. it is funny to see some of those Zoom calls where we're all in there and everyone's got their different backgrounds. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's definitely interesting. Yeah. And people don't always understand the, um, like the business aspect of it. And you know, getting the bills paid, get, keeping, making sure that you know, people have what they need. And so there's a whole back office function to an institution that people don't see. But in times like this, that actually might be the most important function. So making sure that those back office things are operational and our business office did most of that work. Yeah. So that's been key. And like you said, they, you know, they have kind of set us up and, and have made yeah. us, you know, in a really good situation in this, in this spot. So kind of putting all of that together and, and kind of wrapping this up, um, uh, you know, with everything going on right now and, and now, you know, us being completely online, do you have a certain message? Cause I know that, you know, you've been pushing this for sure about how the situation is so disruptive for everybody and, and how we can continue to stay on that right track. And do you have a message to the students and as well as the GBC community? I think we have to remember to be patient with each other through this kind of time. Um, you know, people are scared. And when people are scared, sometimes they hunker down. Sometimes, um, sometimes conversation becomes unhelpful. <laughs> so we have to be patient and really think the best of each other. And then we need to be consistent and creative in our responses and think outside the box all the time. And we have to be kind to one another. So I think the, the patience, the creativity, and the, the kindness are, if we can remember to do those things, then I think a lot of the rest of it will fall into place. Well, awesome. That is great. Um, and thank you so much. You have been so great here. There's uh, nine months that you've been at GBC, and we are <laughs> so lucky to have you. Um, thank you. For I'm the lucky one. I am lucky to be here. <laughs> That's great. Well, yeah. thank you for coming on. You're welcome, awesome. and thank you.